All right, and I'm putting the agenda back up, and here we go. Everybody take a deep breath. <gasps> Number one, update on building project. That's sort of a generic title that we've been carrying forward, but I think the one thing that um, I heard that we wanted to talk about in that regard for finance was the um, hiring of the PR consultant for the building committee. and. Um, I was at the board meeting and you know, we have the authorization now to move forward with that. We don't have a contract. What we have is a person who has been recommended and who has said that they would be willing, uh, sorry, said that they would be willing to um, to do the job. And um, so Jeff, I think, reached out to her today. Um, oh, by the way, Jeff is on the road and we can text him if we need to, but um, I said I thought we had all the answers from him that we needed. Mm -hmm. And um, so we don't have a contract yet, but we do have um, an estimate of how much uh, we can spend. So I just wanted to take you guys through um, some things that you probably do remember, but you might not have numbers floating around in your brain because I didn't. So in FY21, we had $100,000 in long range planning money. In FY22, we added $286,250, which was a very random sort of amount, but it was based on what um, Harriman had given us for a projected cost for pre-referendum work. Um, and a little sidebar to that is that if you have a construction project that's been approved, you can start to fold in all of those planning and advertising and um, you know promotional kind of costs into the project, and it can be part of the whole budget for the project. But up to the referendum, we don't know that we have a project yet, right? Mm -hmm. So we're using the long range planning money money to get there. So out of that money, we've spent or we've um, obligated, I guess you'd say, 358,000 for Harriman. That's the contract that we've entered into with them for all of their services leading up to the referendum. We've also got a budget for just a little under $10,000 for the leader advertisement campaign that's been going on. Um, and that was budgeted at somewhere really between eight and 10, but under 10. Um, so that leaves $28,250. And what we've said is that for this PR consultant work, we'd probably spend 15 to 20,000 of that. So at this point, the funding I would recommend we use is just that um, the long range planning money that we already have that's specifically allocated for this project right now. We do have some money in the operating budget for strategic planning in both facilities and in um, central office. And those will typically use for things like the enrollment study, for example, that Rebecca did at central office, the central office budget for facilities. We'll use it for things like surveys and mapping and um, engineering costs and things like that. But we do have some operating money where we're not really there yet in terms of needing to spend that. And so Kate, do I hear you saying that the money for the consultant is kind of like on a per diem basis then? It's not a fixed amount. I haven't seen any kind of a proposal for a scope yep. of work yet because again, we were waiting to see whether that it was the will of the board to even enter into a conversation with this person. Gotcha. Um, so the next thing to happen will be that we would um, have the, uh, the consultant and the building committee talk about what's the scope of work? What is your expectation? What's your need? Um, what do we want from this person? Mm -hmm. And then my guess is that it would probably be a flat fee because most folks in that line That's of work true. would work based on a, a fee basis, but maybe with a, an hourly rate for additional services, That's something true. like that. I'm imagining that we'll have that um, ironed out this week because I think Jeff reached out to her today. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Just for my note per my note taking purposes, can you remind me the FY21 amount that you had 
in there for long range planning? Yeah, FY21 was 100,000 even. 100,000, okay. And then in FY22, we added, added the 286. 286, 250. 250. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So the 100,000 was really almost like a placeholder because we knew stuff was going to happen, but we didn't know what. Yeah. And then we we ended up with a, a solid figure of 386 that we needed. And so that was why we put that second amount in the, the following year. Oh, that makes sense. So I don't really have a lot of answers about the actual contract or you know what the arrangement is yet, but I do know that we've got sufficient funding to do what's been outlined to me. And do you have any thoughts on um, with Harriman kind of redoing some past work on numbers, running numbers with updated updated cost projections? If that's within the scope of the three hundred and 58,000 that we had on contract for them? Or do you that's think that's going question. to be out of scope? It's a good question. It, it's going to depend on the amount of time that they would have to devote to something like that. Um, so, you know, I, I think before they dive in too deeply, I don't know that we would want them to do, you know, days and days and days and uh, of work. Yeah. Okay. It's a good I don't know that that's the intention. I think you know the 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 worksheets that they have are already built in it. It would just be a question of refreshing some data, but I'm I'm not really sure. About that. That's what I was hoping to, but I just never know. Sometimes these things take a life of their own. That's true. That's true. And and if you ask me, my opinion is let's not go back and rehash what we've already done. You can quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and, uh, yeah, and and I, I, uh, never mind. Never mind. All right. So, any okay. thoughts about any other thoughts about that? I mean, I'm sure we'll have some more information by the time we get together again, or probably before that, that we can talk about. That makes sense to me. Okay. Anybody else? All right. I Do have one more, one more big housekeeping thing to do. Okay. Um, you guys cool on the uh, PR person question? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's not a lot. There's nothing. There's not, point. not much. Yeah. yeah. Nothing to say. Nothing. Yeah. To say. Okay. As long as we know, you know, what we're working with, and mm -hmm. well, I, yeah, I think it'll be. I think it'll be yeah. really interesting to know what that person can do for us. You know, yeah. What's, what's the the best use of those dollars for sure? Mm -hmm. Um, so I have a quick sidebar and I, I emailed, I'm sorry I did this at the last minute, but um, Jeff and I have been talking with the uh, engineers, Woodard and Curran, that helped us out with the, the track and turf renovation project. Um, they've been with us from the start doing the project planning. Um, just to give you a quick um, recap of where we have been, um, we started out on the turf and track being done as a single project. Um, $1.9 million was budgeted, it went to referendum and the voter said, yep, you can do that. And the idea was to do it as one big project to renovate the turf, remove the damaged dead old turf and also at the same time do the track, uh, which is also pretty much past its useful life and can't be resurfaced anymore. It has to be dug out and, and rebuilt. Um, so fast forward a few months to the point where we were putting those plans together and it became um, known to our team that was working on that renovation that the building committee was thinking about possibility of, of siting the new K2, K3 building on that land. Um, that at least it was being considered as, you know, as a, as a viable alternative to some of the other sites that they were looking at. Um, so the decision was made at that time uh, to cut the project in half and to do the simpler piece of the project, which was to take off the old turf, regrade, and put new turf surface on top. And that happened last spring, and y'all know how gorgeous the turf looks now, and um, it's uh, it's been great. It's been wonderful, but the track has still got the same problems that it had when we started the project. So um, in the, let's see, 
what month is this? In the fall, we went back to Woodard and Curran at the point where the building committee said, you know, that really isn't a viable site for us. We wanted to make sure that the, we weren't going to be putting in you know, $2 million worth of renovations on a space that was going to be then potentially torn up for some other use. Right. And we went forward with the turf because the turf, um, we learned the shock pad and the actual turf could be repurposed. It could be relocated if we were gonna relocate um, that turf field. That wouldn't have been the case with the track because it's built in, it's pavement basically. So um, long story short, after the building committee decided that that wasn't going to be a site that they were going to entertain because it didn't really have the right um, features for a building of the size that we're, um, we're projecting, the uh, team that was working on the turf and track went back together and uh, got Woodard and Curran to join us again and to sort of ramp up for the second half of the project, which is to fix the track. So we've been working on that for a few months now. They've been writing um, the specs and doing the design and the engineering. And we've had surveys and all the things that you need to do when you're gonna do a construction project. And last week, um, Jeff and I ended up talking with them about uh, a little bit of a left turn on this project as well. Originally, and still, we were planning bid documents to go out to contractors and do a formal traditional bid process, which is where you put out an invitation to bid, you put it in the newspaper, post it online, and uh, any qualifying contractor can submit a bid. This is what you would normally do with construction uh, projects. Um, Last week, I was talking with Woodard and Curran and the specialist there that we're working with, who is actually an um, athletics uh, facility specialist, said, have you thought about just going back to the contractor that you used for the turf and doing a contract with that company who also does tracks through uh, what they call a co-op purchasing plan? And a little sidebar there, co-op purchasing organization is an organization that does the bidding for you. You become a co-op member and we're members of different co-ops. We're members of um, a co-op for school nutrition, for example, so that they buy their milk at a, at a fixed cost that the co-op has, um, has negotiated and they buy some of their food supplies, paper goods. So, there's a co-op that we used for the first part of the pro of the project. Um, it's called TIPS. It's a government and school co-op. It's national. And what the co-op does is they do the bid process. They vet the vendors. They have construction experts in all different kinds of fields who go through all the bids and say, yes, you're a qualifying vendor. They don't actually qualify a project because they're not um, they're not running a project. What they're doing is they're pre-qualifying vendors. They're deciding what would be a reasonable cost for any given project. They're using industry standards and regional pricing calculations. And they're coming up with um, like a stamp of approval that says, if you go to this vendor, you're going to get a good price. They're a qualified person. They know what they're doing and they're available in your region. And you can basically trust that you've, you've done your due diligence in terms of finding a vendor. So Geosurfaces is the vendor that we used for the turf. And um, so Tom Che, who's the expert that we've been talking with that we're in current last week says to me, well, Geosurfaces is gonna have to come back anyway. They are gonna have to refit, peel back, undo the turf, reshape it when the track goes around because they, they've got to attach it to the new track, to the edge and the curbing of the track. They're going to be on site anyway. Have you ever given any thought to having them be the contractor for the project? They do tracks too. Well, okay, yeah, kind of, I guess. It sounds good. Why would I do that? You know, why wouldn't I go out and do a traditional bid? And the answer was really three things. One is traditional bid process. You're going to have a bunch of contractors who don't have the time and energy 
to submit a bid in the first place because all the construction people that we're talking to right now are outstream. Mm -hmm. And they might not even go to the trouble of saying, you know, of, of offering a bid mm -hmm. on a project like this. Because for some folks, it'd be a small project, right? The second thing is timing. You said you could go to the co-op and you could have a price within a week or so. If you got to go through the bid process, you've got to advertise, you've got to put bids out, you've got to give everybody a chance to do a site visit, you've got to, it's probably a three or four week process mm -hmm. until you can open the bid and find out what your pricing is. Mm -hmm. And so Woodard and Curran is saying, you know, you, you could know your price in the first week instead of the fourth week. And you'd be that much further ahead in terms of whether you can pull this project off. And the third reason is that when you do a traditional bid process, you really have to have your scope of work laid out. So everybody's bidding on the same level, right? It's a it's a level playing field, not, not to use a sports analogy, but um, for the bidders, you are saying, you know, here's here's our specs, here's our design, here's what we want to do, and everybody give us your best offer. If you then select the low bid or you select the best qualified bid and you start negotiating with that vendor and saying, well, you know, this is a little bit out of our price range. What if we took this off or what if we changed that? What if we decided not to do this portion of it or we shifted the parameters a little bit? You run the risk of actually invalidating the bid process because now you've not given all those other vendors the opportunity to be responsive to your actual project. They've only got what you started with. Mm -hmm. So we could get a complaint from, um, from another vendor saying, you didn't do this right. So at that point, if you do that, then you've got, if you have a project that comes in and the lowest qualified bid is still a little bit too high, then you have to say, well, we're not doing it or start over. And again, time is of the essence. And if we don't have a way to move forward by the 1st of May, we're not getting this project done this year. So um, looking at our bid policy, I talked with Jeff. He's heard this whole story with me. And there's a clause in our bid policy, which is DJE, DJE which says that the superintendent can forego a bid process that isn't required by law, which this isn't, if the circumstances make it such that that's a really good choice for the district. That's, I mean, I'm maybe paraphrasing just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially it says, you know, as, as, if, there's, if there is a, a way to do a purchase outside of traditional bidding, that makes sense in the circumstances for the district, then the superintendent has the authority to do so, but needs to advise the board that that's happening. So that really long-winded conversation is to say that I've, having heard all of this, having gone out, research tips, spent some time talking with Woodard and Curran, I've recommended to Jeff that we go for it and that we the do the co-op route. Yeah. And the worst thing that happens is that we get an, um, a, an, a proposal that doesn't meet our needs or a price that doesn't meet our needs. We can still do a bid process, but we would be so much earlier if this works. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a bunch of reasons that are moving me. One of the reasons that I think for me is the most compelling is that Geosurfaces has already been on the site. They've already done the work. They already know the layout. Right. They would probably be two weeks ahead of any other vendor anyway, just because of their familiarity with the project. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have to gear up in the same way that somebody who's coming to it cold would have to do. Mm -hmm. So this is me saying to you guys as representatives of the board that this is what we'd like to do. And that that's typically how we've done the notification um, in the handful of times that we've gone outside of the bid policy is to bring it to finance because y'all are supposed to know what we're talking about. And that um, would, so, Go ahead, Diane. I was going to say, and that would presumably keep us on solid track for starting the project 
with the dates that we have in mind so that there'd be minimal impact by the time we return to school in the fall. Yeah, so the, the goal all along has been not to disrupt fall sports because it's so much harder to relocate fall sports. Right. Um, it's not going to be super easy to relocate spring sports, but there there's um, fewer teams, fewer players, and more facilities that might be available to us in the spring than would be in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the colleges are all done in the middle of May. Um, and so we can do some of the later season track and, and lacrosse mm -hmm. at UNE. Um, they're looking at USM's field house. Mike's got a whole really complicated plan. Mm -hmm. But in the fall, there would be no way. There's no place to go because everybody's using those facilities. So, so going the co-op route, we would get um, a number quicker mm -hmm. and then likely similar numbers if we were to go the traditional bidding route. Yeah, I think that what what they're saying to me is that because it's sort of pre-qualified mm -hmm. and they're the the vendors have agreed that they're going to meet industry standards in terms of pricing and quality, that it's kind of like they've already done that work for you. Mm -hmm. um, and that the the fact that it could shave a couple of weeks off of that process and end up with a very good outcome at the end, where it, it's, you know, in my mind, it would have been quite likely that we would have selected geosurfaces anyway, right? Um, because they're one of the few specialty vendors who can do this kind of work. Right. So, Carolyn, I don't want to jump over you because you're on the screen. Well, that's okay. Um... Can you tell me how much of the 1.9 has been spent and how much is oh, yeah. earmarked for the uh, for the uh, track, the payment? That is, that is a good question. I jumped right over that in my notes. So we have a balance of 1.15 million left. And we did ask Woodard and Kern to put together a new estimate of just the track portion. Mm -hmm. And so we're pretty close. I think that, you know, we... It's certainly in the right ballpark, but that's part of the question about negotiating after we get a price because you know if if the answer is you can do the track, but you can't renovate the um, shot put circle, you're going to have to come up with another solution for that. That's the kind of conversation that we could have in this situation where we wouldn't necessarily be able to do that in a traditional bid process. My understanding. Go ahead, that, Freyla. My understanding when um, when the public was informed that they were only going to do the turf, it was because we didn't have enough money to do both projects. So we anticipate that was what was put out there about why the decision for the track only. So was that accurate or was that inaccurate? I don't think that we didn't have enough money. I don't think that messaging was put out by the district. Mm. No, that the my yeah, Freyla, my rec my recollection on that was just exactly what Kate had said that it's a viable option for the unified school. Um, so what you were saying that doesn't ring a bell for me, but maybe oh, that yeah. was something that was out there. I think there were some early estimates that were very high from Woodard and Kern, and so there was a worry for sure that we wouldn't be able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. um, but the tr the turf portion actually came in well under what they had estimated. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, and it's hard to say where a message comes from, Frilla. I don't know that you know I can say that that's not accurate 100 percent because there was some discussion about whether we were going to be able to have enough mm -hmm. money to to do the job. But I never really had a doubt myself uh -huh. that we'd be able to do at least, you know, the the ninety nine percent core of the project okay. that we had available. Yeah, I really think maybe it, it had to do with the fact that we couldn't talk so much about the building right. sites yep. and what was a viable was a, site and what wasn't. That so much of that was sure. executive session. Right. The only biggest fear was was that was like we have to peel it off again. Right. Are we going to invest $2 yeah. million dollars in something mm -hmm. and then say, oh, wait, never mind, let's tear it up, you know? Right. I, know I totally understand that, but they weren't talking about the sites at the time. So when it was put out there, the perception of some folks was they don't have enough money to do we it. Don't, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I think there was, there was messaging that it was, 
it was going to cost more than we originally budgeted for. Yeah. Um, because it failed the first time around. Oh, passed. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. When it was put on, when it was put into our budget, it was a big jump in terms of what we had, um, what the town had put out at referendum when it mm -hmm. failed. Um, so that's for sure part of the message was that when when the school department said we're sort of taking over the project and we're going to put it in our budget and we're going to advocate for it and we'll carry it through, it was a significantly higher number than what the town had put out before and had put to referendum and then it failed. So um, there was definitely a lot of talk about why would it be so much more money? Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, when when we first got the estimates of of cost from Woodard and Curran, it was pretty tight. It was, you know, we were thinking we were going to need to do value engineering, they call it, which is to mm -hmm. sort of, you know, rework your scope of work. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not saying that we wouldn't do that necessarily even with this co-op purchase because we don't know what they're going to give us for a price. Um, but in terms of the estimates that we've gotten from the engineers, we're pretty close. Would we go through the co-op process or would we just go straight to geo services? Because it well, sounds like we're going to go straight to geo services. It's a little of both, right? Okay. Because in the co-op process, what I'm doing is I'm saying to geo services, I'm a co-op member and I want you to give me your co-op proposal and pricing. Okay, I understand. Okay. So, and I asked that question because I was like, well, do you, you know, pick like four vendors and go in the co-op and do you do it that way? And, and um, Tom Shea explained that, no, you just, you just, know that the vendor that you're selecting from the co-op has already kind of gone through this process and has already been vetted and will give us pricing that is competitive through the co-op. So it's a little different from calling up geosurfaces and saying, hey, what are you going to charge me for this? Anyway, because they've, they've agreed to certain parameters um, up front. And is there any harm in doing both at the same time? Doing the uh, bid process and the co-op? Starting the bid process and getting the number from the co-op. Therefore, we're not putting ourselves behind, but therefore, but we can move forward and then we can cancel the bid process if we decide to go forward with the co-op. I think we'd be able to do do it without even getting to the point where we had to cancel Release anything. It. Yeah. Right. Because the original timetable was for Woodard and Curran to have all the design specs and everything ready to go for the bid process by April 1st. We're just at the beginning of March right now. And it sounds like we could reach out to geosurfaces through the co-op and get some kind of response that we could even, you know, we can analyze and and, and determine whether it's it's viable before we would even be at the point of putting out that invitation to bid. So if we got to the point where we said, eh, you know, we're not really comfortable with this, we're not, we don't like it, then we could just go on with the same timeline with the traditional bid process. Yeah, because I'm just concerned about justifying an expenditure of over a million dollars to the taxpayers in Scarborough and saying we decided to, we just like this vendor, so we're going to go with them and we can explain the co-op process and how this works. But at the end of the day, what they're going to say is he didn't do the competitive bid process. This is a massive project. Mm -hmm. You know, our our limit of, of doing this is fifty thousand normally. This is a lot more than fifty thousand dollars worth of work. Uh, and the competitive bid pro uh, process is really just intended to make sure we're getting a good, good you know value for the project. And I understand the constraints with construction, with, like with the industry right now. But I think it's I think we're going to get some pretty tough questions about our decisions mm -hmm. not to go through a traditional bid process. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be nice to know what the traditional bids were to compare to the co-op bid. Gotcha. So I agree with you. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Kate. Um, so what that. you're saying is that we should do the bid process also. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, I, and, then, and then you can come back and say the geo services came back a little bit five percent higher than the lowest bid, but they can deliver that four weeks sooner. They already, they already know that they're going to save us time. They're going to save us moving spring sports or fall sports or one of the sports. And that, that is a worthwhile expenditure for the sake of busing transportation for sports. 
the facility rental for sports. So like, like there's ways to justify not going to the lowest bid. Um, as a state worker, we always do the lowest yeah, bid. Yeah, we but. don't. <laughs> we actually have best bid rather than low bid, yeah. which is very nice um, yeah. because of all those reasons mm -hmm. that you know about. I think the difficulty is that if we went through the traditional bid process, we wouldn't save any time because developing that the bid packet allowing them time for site reviews and all of the traditional steps that you have to take to have a vendor be ready to do um, a reasonable bid and to understand enough about the project to be able to do the bid. We'd probably be uh, by the end of April before we actually had something in hand that we could compare with what Geosurfaces is offering to us. So really the shortcut is in not doing the bid. It's in avoiding the bid process. And I totally get what you what you're saying. I mean, I I spent a lot of time thinking about this myself because I'm I've always been familiar with if you have a construction project, you go out to bid. You just do. That's mm -hmm. what you do. And co-op purchasing is new. Um, even Woodard and Current has only done about half a dozen of these through the co-op. But um, so it, it brings a level of in unfamiliarity and, and some discomfort. Um, I guess the question could be how many qualified vendors actually participate in a co-op um, arrangement? Mm -hmm. I can see people? where you can, yeah, I can see where you can get the co-op to kind of be bid like because if there's several several vendors that participate but i i'm kind of falling into Frela's camp as well with um sensitive to the public opinion and what we're doing especially as we're moving forward with the school and mm -hmm. just want to make sure everything seems to be you know t's crossed i's dotted and uh it just makes me a little nervous what um what could be misconstrued mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in public, in the public discourse that could be out there about that. Um, so what if we had something put together and out for public bid, you said um, you could have, you, did you say you could have the packet put together by the end of April or you would have the have bids back by April. Bids would be back. The original um, back timeline April. with the engineers who are working on this for us was that they would have the bid packet ready to go out at the beginning of April and that we would have a contractor selected by the end of April so that it could start at the 1st of May. Okay. Um, and I, I don't, I really don't know um, I don't know how far behind the eight ball we would be if that didn't work out. And that's my worry is, is that we get all the bids back. We don't have the opportunity to negotiate and they're not meeting our needs. And so we're done. There's nothing, nothing left to do. And the, the project doesn't get finished. But couldn't we switch over to the co-op at that point? It wouldn't be, I don't think there would be enough time because a co-op vendor isn't going to write us a proposal at the end of April and be able to start working May 1st. Yeah, that makes sense. The advantage is for the co-op person to be able to schedule us into their mm -hmm. summer work way ahead of time. And again, these are specialty providers, so there's only a couple of them that would be qualified to do the work. Um, so if we waited through the bid, bid process and, you know, maybe Geosurfaces even is one of the bidders and, and none of the bids come in to fit our needs, then you have to go back and renegotiate. Yeah. Well, then we start over or, right, you have to do the value engineering and you have to change mm -hmm. your scope of work and give mm -hmm. all the vendors a chance to write again. And, and then you're talking it. about maybe doing it um, a year, year later, yeah. which <laughs> that has a lot of other costs. That come with that. Well, yeah, I mean, Mike is in the process of trying to set everything up with his uh, right associates and other 
So I'm also playing timekeeper here. We have less than 20 minutes left in this. And we haven't talked today. about the budget. We haven't talked at all about uh, the CIG budget. Rails. So I'm I don't sorry. know, you know, how you want to move forward on this. Well, I haven't given you any time to process this either. And right. I got to tell you, it took me a few days to sort of go, is this mm -hmm. the right way to go? Is it not the right way to go? And I kind of got there. Um, and so I don't necessarily mean that I expect you guys to sort of change your minds or or have different opinions, but maybe we set it aside for a minute and we talk about budget and then we come back around to it. I would like to know how many companies in the area are qualified to do the work. Okay. Because if there if there are 20 companies qualified to do the work, I'm gonna it's gonna be a hard sell for me not to go through their traditional process which is frankly what we were planning on originally. Like the original plan was to do the bid process because mm -hmm. that, that was the, that was, so this timeline was established with the original plan. Yep. Um, if there's two or three companies, I'm more likely to be swayed that way because there's just not, not that many options out there. Yeah. And so true. the competitive bid process is less valuable right. when there's only two or three companies. When there's, you need a critical mass to make the bidding process competitive. Exactly. If it's not a competitive process then, that's the answer to the public, which is right. it's not a competitive process. It kind of, you're reminding me of what, what I was saying uh, to Jeff earlier is that that's the way that they do school buses because there's only about mm -hmm. three companies yeah. that can make school buses. Exactly. So far in this region, I've only heard of two companies that could do this work. It, it, can you ask? I mean, but I'll find that out for certain sure. What, what any current would know. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. They'll know. Exactly. So again, that would be really helpful for my thinking to sort of because again, yeah. I don't think the bid process is all that valuable for two companies. I just right, and maybe right. maybe yeah. would we, we, we continue this conversation offline yeah. and and get some more information? Yeah. What about you, Carolyn? Are there things that would be helpful to you in terms of, um, you know, I I think that we can we can describe and explain lots of things. Yeah. And we can and and we are sort of held to the standard of being the ones who vet and and figure things out and and, yeah. and are the experts in the subject. So yeah. no what what Freyla what Freyla said a few minutes ago just replicated exactly what was in my mind. If there's just a few vendors, which is what I thought I heard you say earlier, um, and they're both and they're all two or three or four of them are in the co-op, then co-op's probably a, a fine way to go. But to her point earlier as well, if there's more, then um, I would I would also lean towards doing the bid. But it, if, it, if it is indeed a small world, let's find out how small that world is. Yeah, yeah. that's definitely something I could talk with them about tomorrow. Okay, thank so you. I think that we want to just reconvene a short finance meeting, perhaps later this week or at the end or at the beginning of next week so that a decision can be made. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. And I can reach out online and, and tell you what I'm learning. And maybe if you think of other questions you'd like me to ask them um, in the interim, we can regroup a little bit on this. We have exactly 15 minutes. <laughs> well, and, 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 and my, my, uh, my goal is to give you homework. Mm -hmm. And I have actual paper things here, Carolyn. In the <laughs> okay, room. I'll come in. <laughs> you don't have to come in because we I'm, can send them to you electronically. Gonna, that works really well. I just sort of <laughs> have to get down the table. I like here. paper too. Well, you can have paper, uh, but I, I'll also I'll also email this to you. Um, okay. So what I've got is the executive summary of the budget book. And the budget book is what 60, 70 pages long. Mm -hmm. And the executive summary is 10 pages long. Um, it's the piece that we hope that at least everybody will read that piece <laughs> because it's going to give them the high level approach to our budget. And um, what I'm hoping from you guys is to be the be the leaders, um, be the ones who are taking the reins of this away from the leadership team. And so as soon as we do our first reading, it becomes the board's budget that the board is going to be representing and the board is going to be making decisions about. Um, so the homework is to just read through the executive summary before Monday. 
get the high level idea of what it is that the leadership council is putting out there. On Monday, we have our first workshop. And um, a lot of the sort of high level ideas about budget drivers and costs and, and um, why the budget is what it is are in the executive summary. But then we wanna do the walkthrough so that you really get to talk to everybody in the leadership team about the whys and get a little bit more detail about what's going on in each, um, in each building and each department. The, the full budget book will be done by the end of this week. I'm hoping to have it ready for Friday morning so that any board member can take it. And I know you have nothing to do on the weekends, so you could you know, kind of page through it before Monday night. Um, but you don't need to feel that you have to either because we use the budget book as kind of the accompanying text to go along with the workshop. So you can taking notes in it and so forth. Um, so our two workshops are gonna be Monday night and Wednesday morning. And right after that, it's school board's first reading. So um, what I wanna say about first reading is that our friends at the newspaper sometimes take the first budget proposal and put it on the front page and put big shiny numbers that say school budget is going to be really big and scary and dangerous. And we keep having to say, it's the first reading. We're putting it on the table. A lot is gonna happen between now and when we vote on this in May. Um, and you know that's two full months before we actually have a final budget proposal. So you'll see some things in there about what I like to call items in motion, which are things that we know are gonna change between now and the second reading. Um, things that are coming from the outside world, like our anthem rates that we're not gonna know for another month. <laughs> the big cost driver um and you know that's not even gonna not even to say that we're making any decisions that's just sort of stuff that's happening to us and cost quotes and and projections are coming into us all the time between now and, and when we do second reading um but so we, we need to kick things off yeah so basically i was going to say because there's basically no time between the 13th 15th and then our first reading at the 16th for any changes to happen so the first reading right. is basically okay here's our draft mm -hmm. and then and then how does the process work after that um i know we have to go to it goes to the town mm -hmm. um yeah. Town, so council. So where does the input happen? Like to the in the first reading, do we say, hey, we'd like to beef this up and shave this down a little bit? Or how, where do those interactions happen? So we don't generally get into the line item kind of review um, at the first reading. Again, it's really just to kick off to put the proposal on the table. In the same way that, like you said, here's our here's our draft. Here's what the leadership team thinks we should have for a budget. We're kick, we're handing it over to the school board to be revised and reviewed and and um, discussed. So my recommendation would be that we get past the first reading, and then we probably don't do a whole heck of a lot in terms of decision making until we've got to the town council's rollout. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have the um, presentation on the 29th, which is the town school budget. And then town council's first reading is on April 5th. So the time between the 16th and the 29th, for me is a time for um, you folks to come up with questions, to come up with wonders and, and, um, and maybe communication points and FAQ kind of stuff that, um, you're digging into our budget proposal and finding out what your questions are. And then we begin to, to learn the will of the council. Um, the town council doesn't have line item jurisdiction over our budget, but they have bottom line jurisdiction. So if they're saying, you know, we, we're headed for a different budget target, we want to make sure that um, the tax rate isn't increasing too much, so we're going to ask the school and the town to cut a certain amount from their budget. Do we know what what their percentage they're targeting or what their overall budget their target is, or do they not tell us until the first reading? So it's interesting because in a finance committee meeting, town council finance committee meeting, 
a couple of months ago, they floated out the no more than 3% tax increase that they've had since 2016. And um, you know, my response to that is it's not 2016. The in inflation rate is not 1.2%, which is what it was when they came up with that idea. Um, and uh, instead the inflation rate is 6.5 on a good day. So it's gonna be really tough to meet that target. Um, but I know that the town council also knows that and the town manager also knows that. Um, so I don't think that we're gonna be the only ones going, hey, stuff costs more. I just, you know, it, 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 it can't be avoided. Um, interestingly, I think that our, our increase in our gross budget, general fund budget is almost exactly the same as it was last year but we've got a little bit of a reduction in um, state subsidy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And last year we were able to throw in an extra amount of fund balance, which we don't really have this year. We're basically using the same level. Um, so it's it's a little bit more of a revenue problem than it is an expenditure problem for us. Um, but to go back to what you were saying, Frilla, I had a like two second conversation with, with Don Hamill who came to the board meeting last week for the enrollment study. And he said he's been looking at different metrics and was interested in knowing what we were looking at because they have um, they have a big chunk of their personnel and collective bargaining agreements too, just like we do. Mm -hmm. And so they've negotiated contracts with salaries and and you know they're they're gonna have to look at what's reasonable and viable for the town as well as the school department. Okay. So the three percent is floating out there, but I think it, it might have to float a little okay. <laughs> further. Okay. So since I can't look at the executive summary just yet, can you give me a or are you is it okay to say where we're at right this minute? Yes, it is okay to say where we're at right this minute. Um, so right now we're at a 6.23% increase on the gross general fund operating budget. That is the K-12 operating budget. And um, the net is 7.31%. And historically, if we've been somewhere around five and a half or six percent on our net, it has translated to less than a three percent increase on the tax rate. Because remember, the increase in our budget or our tax ask is not the same thing as the increase on the tax rate. Mm -hmm. The school's budget is combined with the town's budget, mm -hmm. and then the valuation change is calculated. And so the bottom line is actually, we're just a little piece of that. Um, and, you know, traditionally, we've been quite close if yes. we're right around 6%. I think the tax, um, the tax increase, if everything were equal, town school, we might be thinking in terms of 4% but that's not really my number to give, you know, it's not, but it's not going to be like, oh gosh, towns, towns, people open your wallets. Right. Like, so our percentage doesn't equate to the tax. Increase. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I was, I don't want to take extra time here because I know we're like yeah, done, like but what I'll do, minutes. Carolyn, is I'll email this to you in just a minute so that you can, read it through and and again the the goal that we have is going to be making sure that this team has all their questions answered knows the why of everything those workshops to me are one of the most valuable things that we can do because you're hearing it from the horse's mouth you're getting the true story of what's going on and you have the opportunity to ask questions from people who really know the answers instead of just hearing me babble at you is there a possibility that those workshops can be hybrid um, I had a gross sexual assault trial set on oh, for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. So I'm not I'm not going to be here. They are planned already. Kelly and I were talking through this this um, morning, actually. They're planned to be live streamed then on Zoom anyway. We're gonna have an owl there. Perfect. So, you know, we just what we'll to have to do is we'll webinar. just have to make sure that the person who is presenting at the time is close enough to the owl. Right, because as you as you know, yeah. 
like the larger the group is, the harder it is yeah, to yeah. kind of pick people up. But um, that's our intention anyway, so it shouldn't be a problem. Perfect. So I should be able to make the Monday evening one if I'm, I should be done by that point. Um, I don't think I'll be here though, so I'll probably be Dana Augusta for that. And then Wednesday, I think my jury's going to be out, so I don't know what my schedule will be. Right. Like at that point, I can't predict that far. Into it. it was a five-day trial last time, and in this trial two years ago, and it's back. Oh, great. And we were back up to a backup, so we just got yeah. shoe laddered into yeah. it. So yeah. we can work around it. Well, and there's always stuff that comes up. And, you know, yeah. and I don't mean to say that, like, this is the only opportunity. I yeah. do. I do. I really want to start repeating yeah. the information a lot yeah. at some point, also. Yeah. But I'll do everything I can to get to, to there. But if it's, oh, and if, if it's. And at the very it. least, it'll be recorded so you can yeah, watch it on the and, you know, and I would encourage you as part of this team to make all as many, you know, lists of questions that you can. One of the things I want to talk about is, okay, what's our messaging in terms of working with communications committee? Yeah, yeah last We've year we scheduled portal. communications met up with town council mm -hmm. around the budget. That's a good idea. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll touch base with Jillian to see if that's happening again. Yeah, I put the um, budget calendar in there so that you could see what the different bits are that where we relate to them. But oh, yeah. Um, I want to interject one quick thing. I know Shannon had a question regarding the um, enrollment study and the impact of that on the budget. So I know you have three minutes. <laughs> Well, so, so far we haven't really had a chance to unpack what it means for no. next year, but I think that all of what we were seeing had more to do with the next few years out. Yeah, I did spend um, some time on that this morning. Diane's um, been our, our data guru. Right. Huh. On and that. so, yeah, I think what we were already planning for for next year was based on the 2019 enrollment study. So I went in today to some of my spreadsheets and I, um, you know, um, did an overwrite with the most current cool. study and we're still tracking where, um, you know, in a similar spot. So in terms of needing additional staff or programming for next year, um, where, where, where we should be, obviously you've all seen the report and I think the concern really bodes for the five future years, yeah. mm -hmm. five years definitely so they show up yeah so and I guess the the good news is we didn't instantly go oh my god we've screwed up our budget for next right. year we no. were really we're, because like we <laughs> have like I have been using those numbers year over yeah. year as we do our enrollment projections already right so now I'm just transferring out um and mm -hmm. backing those numbers out and putting the new ones in mm -hmm. yeah and you can you correct it along the way. Not that there's a big fraction, but you're right. able to apply yeah. along the way. Yeah. Yeah. So right. um, next steps, if I'm minute. gonna send an email to you, Carolyn, <laughs> with that executive summary in it right now. And I will um, reach out to Woodard and Kern tomorrow to talk a little bit more about how that, um, you know, who they think the viable vendors would be in this region and get back to you on that piece. We'll figure out the next step on that. And um, I guess we could talk about, uh, my, my last question was, are we going to have our meeting on March 27th, which would be our regularly scheduled meeting? I think you're on mute, Carolyn. Yeah. Carolyn, you're muted. And it is 4.30, so I'm not trying to be yeah. pushy, but I guess have to get us on to another meeting. meeting. Yeah, I, I think that's probably wise when we can dive into the budget. I would love it. Yeah, I, I think it'd be it'd yeah. be the right time because we'd already have learned uh, a few things and, and had time to digest them and then really dig a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. And Kate, on in your email, can you define for me like between gross and net? I know in my world what that means, but I want to make sure I understand yeah. it in the school world. <laughs> I'm Absolutely. guessing it's revenue, but um, you got it. Anyway, just want to make sure I know. All right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank Have you. We'll see you soon. Bye.